We're going to control this game using the accelerometer that comes as standard on all iPads. But it has a problem. It doesn't come as standard on any Macs. This course isn't called Giving Up With Swift, so we're going to add a hack. In the simulator, you'll have to use Touch. And on devices, you'll have to use Tilting. To get started, we'll add a property so we can reference the player throughout the game. We'll say for our game scene, var player is an SK sprite node implicitly unwrapped. We're going to add a dedicated create player method that loads the sprite, gives it circle physics, and adds it to the scene. But it's going to do three other things that are important. First, it's going to set the physics body's allows rotation property to be false. We haven't changed that so far, but it does what you might expect. When false, the body no longer rotates as it moves around. This is useful here because a ball looks like a marble. It's shiny, and those reflections wouldn't rotate in real life. Second, we're going to give the ball a linear damping value of 0.5, which applies a lot of friction to its movement. This game will still be hard, but this does help a little bit by slowing the ball down naturally. Finally, we'll be combining three values together to get the ball's contact test bit mask, the star, the vortex, and the finish area. Let's write create player now. We'll say func create player. Player is an SK sprite node with the image named player. Its position is going to be CG point X 96 Y 672. And that's positioned exactly right for level one. Next, we'll add circle physics. We'll say player.physics body is equal to an SK physics body. Circle of radius, player dot size dot width divided by two. Then player physics body question mark dot allows rotation is false. And player physics body question mark dot linear damping equals 0.5. As for its bit masks, we'll say player physics body uh, category bit mask is collision types dot player dot raw value and player physics body contact test bit mask what we told about well that's three things uh, we'll do collision types dot star dot raw value pipe collision types dot vortex dot raw value and again pipe collision types dot finish dot raw value and finally uh, player physics body collision bit mask is collision types dot wall dot raw value and add that to our game scene boom like that now these pipes here are why the bit masks are so important that means combine this number with that number so if if uh, the one on the left was a one and the one on the right was a two Combining that will make three. Or combining three and four will make seven. It adds them together. Now we can go ahead and add a call to create player. Up here in did move to view, after load level, I will say create player. To call that straight away. Let's try running the game now. I'll press Command R again. Boom. Our balls drop down and bounce down here. Now, uh, I'm running a simulator here, the frame rate's very low. If you've got a real device, it should be silky smooth and fast. Now, this game has players looking down on their iPad, so by default, there ought to be no movement. It's only if the player tilts their iPad down, the ball should move downwards. And the ball drops because the scene's physics world has a default gravity, roughly equivalent to Earth's. We don't want that, so I'll add some more code in did move to view. We'll say, physics world, dot gravity is dot zero. Give me no gravity in this thing. So I'll press command R again, and it hasn't really solved much. Let's find out. Boom. But the ball isn't moving now, which means it's a really boring game on the App Store. Before we get on to working with the accelerometer, we're going to put together a hack that lets you simulate the experience of moving the ball using touch. What we're going to do is catch touches began, touches moved, and touches ended, and use them to set or unset a new property called last touch position. Then, in our update method for our game, we'll subtract that touch position from the player's position and use that to set the world's gravity. It's a hack. 
And if you're happy to test on a real device, you don't really need it. But if you're stuck with a simulator, or you're just curious, let's put in the hack. So we'll add our, our property here. We'll say var last touch position is an optional CG point, like that. Now we're going to add touches began and touches moved to set the value of that property using the same three lines of code. We'll make some space at the bottom here and say touches began. Guard let touch is touches dot first, else return. Let location is uh, touch dot location in self. Find out where we touched and use that for the new value of last touch position, like that. Then I'll copy those three lines to my pasteboard, add touches moved, and paste them in there. So it's exactly the same thing when you move or we touch down. And finally, we'll add touches ended. We'll say last touch position is nil. Clear that out, they've stopped touching the screen. That's easy, I know, but it gets only a little bit trickier in the update method. This needs to unwrap our optional property, calculate the difference between the current touch and the player's position, then use that to change the gravity value of the physics world. We'll say, update with some current time. If let last touch position equals last touch position, let diff difference equals a CG point of X, which is last touch position dot X, minus player.position.x and y will be last touch position dot y minus player dot position dot y and with that we can say physics world dot gravity equals a cg vector with a dx being our diff dot x and a dy being our diff dot y now what i find in practice is these things are very, very large values. If you imagine our screen's 1024 across, and the player's at, say, uh, x100, uh, if we tap 100 points away, then we'll make a vector, a gravity vector, we have an, an x of 100. Now remember, Earth gravity is only 9.8, or minus 9.8 uh, on y. So a, a gravity of 100 is a massive, massive movement, you know, more than the Earth's whole gravity. So really, we're gonna scale this movement down a long, long way, so even if we have a difference of a thousand, i.e. the entire width of our screen, that still only ends up being a regular Earth gravity of, of 10 or so. So we'll say our dx is diff x divided by 100, and dy is diff y divided by 100. So bring those values right down in size, so you've got to touch much further away to get stronger movements. Now this is clearly not a permanent solution, but it's good enough you can now run the app and try it out. I'll press Command R and let's see. There's our ball. I'll try and tap below it. You see it moves down a little bit, up a bit again, again. And we'll go over here. And you see it kind of slows down a bit as it gravity changes. There we go. So it's not immediate. You know, it decelerates and then re-accelerates in the other direction, which is exactly how it would do if you were tilting it. Uh, I'll try and go up here and get this star. And you'll see I don't bounce off these stars. I, mean, I hit the wall and I can't go through the wall, but I overlap the stars and I overlap the vortexes, just as you'd expect. Of course, we are being notified, but we aren't currently picking up those notifications, which is why nothing happens just yet. Now for the new bit, which is working with the accelerometer. This is actually surprisingly easy to do, which is remarkable when you think how much is happening behind the scenes. All motion detection is done with an Apple framework called Core Motion, and most of the work is done by a class called CM Motion Manager. Using it here, won't require any special user permissions. So all we have to do is create an instance of the class and ask it to start collecting information. We can then read from that information whenever and wherever we need to. And in this project, the best place is the update method. So first I will scroll up to the top and add an import for core motion. So we get that motion framework. Next, we'll add a property to handle the CM motion manager. So it's created once and kept live during our application's run. I will say down here, var motion manager is a CM motion manager, optional. Now it's just a matter of creating the object and asking it to start collecting accelerometer data. 
This is done using the Start Accelerometer Updates method, which instructs Core Motion to start collecting accelerometer information we can read later on. So in did move 2 I'm going to say Motion Manager is a CM Motion Manager. Motion Manager question mark dot Start Accelerometer Updates. Start collecting that tilt information. The last thing we need to do is poll the motion manager inside our update method, which means to read it, checking to see what the current tilt data is. But there's a complication. We already have a hack in there that lets us test in the simulator. So we want one set of code for the simulator and one set of code for devices. Swift solves this problem by adding special compiler instructions. If the instruction evaluates are true, it'll compile one set of code. Otherwise, it'll compile the other. This is particularly helpful once you realize that any code wrapped in compiler instructions that evaluate to false never gets seen. It's like they never existed. So this is a great way to include debug information or activity in the simulator that never sees the light on devices. The compiler directories we care about are hash if target environment simulator, hash else, and hash end if. As you might have gathered, this is mostly the same as the standard Swift if else block, although here you don't need braces because everything until the else or end if will execute. Let's try that out now. I'm going to scroll down and find our update method way down here. And here's our little hack. So we use touch to scroll around in the simulator. I want this code here, 144 down to 147, only to execute if we are currently inside the simulator. If we're on a device, this code should not exist. It shouldn't work at all. We've got to use tilt instead. So I'll fix that by saying here, hash if target environment simulator. And now all this code here down to hash else, all this code here will only exist when we compile for the simulator. We're running straight here doing like iPad Air third generation. In the else block, we want to add tilt information. So we'll say if let accelerometer data equals motion manager dot accelerometer data. So if we can read some tilt data from our motion manager, then run some code. And the code we're going to run will create a CG vector from the tilt information, how much X and Y tilt we have, and use that for our physics world gravity. But there's a small catch here. We're going to pass the accelerometer y to cg vectors x and accelerometer x to cg vectors y. This is not a mistake. Remember, your device has been rotated to landscape right now, which means you also need to flip your coordinates around. So we'll say in here, physics world dot gravity equals cg vector with the dx being our accelerometer data dot acceleration dot y and for the, the y I'll pass in dot x then after the if let we'll add hash end if to end the compiler directive so this one here start simulator code this is all simulator code this ends simulator and starts the alternative i.e. real devices this is all real device code and that's where the condition actually ends, back to normal code again. Now, in the same way we reduce the size of our vector here, when we're touching the screen in the simulator, we're going to amplify the value of the tilt data, because tilting has very, very gentle values. We don't want to have to make them tilt it very, very far, otherwise they won't be able to see the screen. So we're going to multiply these CG vector values by a large number to make a small tilt do more on the screen. In this instance, we're going to say for dx, we'll multiply by minus 50, and dy, which is the x of the accelerometer, we'll multiply by 50. So it's minus 50 here for dx, and plus 50 for dy. And the reason here is because, again, the device has been rotated. Left and right doesn't mean what you think it means anymore. We've got to invert it on the y-axis. So now I'm going to change my deployment target from iPad Air third generation up to my iPad Pro. I press Command R to build and run the code to deploy to my real device. I'm going to try making tilt work on the real device. 
So there's the ball. I'm now tilting it, and it goes across the way. And it, I mean, it's just it's super nice. It's really really nice. Ah, you can see if you look carefully, the the ball's actually going behind the uh, star and the vortex. Doesn't look great, does it? Really, we could we could fix that very easily. Anyway, so you can see it looks great, and that's always in tilt now, which is really really nice. It's in front of that vortex, so there's a bit of confusion at where the ball lies in terms of uh, its x and y. Uh, let's fix that now before we move on to the next piece. I put my iPad down again, uh, and uh, we're going to scrub up and find the create player method, which is here. We're going to give our player uh, the z position of 1. Now, up here we have positions for our nodes, like the finish and the uh, star and so forth, but they haven't got z positions, which means they have a default value of 0. Uh, and our player had also a default value of zero, so it was somewhere on the same level as those stars and vortexes. And now by saying one for the player and leaving others as a default, it'll now keep the player above the vortexes and stars. Let's try it one last time, make sure it all works nicely. Again, it's still on my iPad Pro. And now, there we go, it's always above the stars and the vortexes. Much, much nicer. Anyway, we have now both device code handling tilting and simulator code handling touches, both automatically being used based on those compiler directors, that target environment stuff.